By now we have discussed a number of chemical reactions that amines undergo. We have also talked about the various ways by which these amines can be prepared. Like some unique reactions like Gabriel thalamide reaction, Hoffman bromomide reactions and so on. So in this video we are going to solve a couple of conversion questions that might involve all of these reactions that you studied in this chapter. Okay, so this is going to be like a brief recap and we won't be able to discuss a lot in this video because it is restricted by time. So I would suggest that you can all go through the exercise, the conversion questions exercise in this chapter and have a better grasp of how to apply these various chemical reactions to convert one reactant to the other. Alright, so let's look at the first question. It says, how can we achieve this conversion? So here we have an alcohol and we are converting it to an amine. But that's not all. Look at the product here. We can see that the product has one carbon atom more than the starting reactant. A reactant is propanol which has one, two, three carbon atoms. But our product is butylamine. One, two, three, four. Four carbon atoms are there in the product. So this is clearly an example of a step up reaction. And by now we know several ways by which step up reactions can be carried out. And in the previous chapter we learnt about Grignard reaction using Grignard reaction and the reaction with aldehydes to achieve step up reactions, right? But we are not going to use any of that here. We are going to try to limit our reactions to the chapter of amines, okay? So based on that, how can we achieve this conversion? Alright, so the first thing to do is how do we introduce an extra carbon atom here? And the most common way of introducing an additional carbon atom is by introducing a cyano group. And then we can convert the cyano group to CH2NH2. What I mean by that is, if we have an RCN group, you know if we manage to introduce a CN group, we have already increased the number of carbon atoms by 1. We have a carbon atom here, correct? And then we can convert the CN to CH2NH2 by using hydrogenation, you know, reacting it with hydrogen in the presence of nickel or palladium or even by using strong reducing agents like lithium aluminium hydride. So the question is, how do we convert ROH to RCN so that we can eventually convert this to RCH2NH2 and get this step of reaction, okay? And the answer to that is simple nucleophilic substitution. So let's try and convert this alcohol to another species which has a much better living group and then use a substitution reaction to introduce a CN group, okay? So let's see how to do that. So the first step would be to convert OH to a better living group. Now there are many ways by which you can do this. So what we are going to do here is to convert alcohol to an alkyl chloride. So for that we employ the reagent cyanyl chloride in a basic medium like pyridine. So when we treat alcohol with thionyl chloride, we are converting it to the corresponding alkyl chloride. And we know that chloride ion is a much better living group as compared to our OH group here. Correct? And now how do we get RCN from here? A straightforward SN2 reaction. So next step is to react our alkyl chloride with alcoholic KCN and perform an SN2 reaction, right? So CN minus is the nucleophile here. It attacks the carbon here and eliminates a chloride ion giving us this substituted product. And now we can perform a reduction reaction or treat this alkyl cyanide with hydrogen in the presence of nickel or palladium to convert it to CH2 NH2 group here. So this is a simple straightforward reaction. Now if I want to extend this reaction a little further, let's say uh, convert our amine to the corresponding alcohol, butylamine to butanol. Is there a way by which we can achieve this conversion? Can you think of any reaction that you've discussed in this chapter that can help us achieve this conversion? Well, how about converting our amine to the corresponding diazonium salt? Let's say by treating our amine with NaNO2 and HCl, basically HNO2, we can convert our amine to the corresponding aliphatic diazonium salt. And we know this is highly unstable, so it would immediately decompose and give us the corresponding alcohol along with effervescence, along with the evolution of the nitrogen gas. In fact, this is a classic test, right? It's a classic test to identify if our sample contains a primary amine, more specifically primary aliphatic amine. So this primary aliphatic amine can undergo diazotization to give us the corresponding alcohol along with the evolution of nitrogen gas. 
Now this is not asked in the question directly but I just wanted to touch upon this reaction as well. Okay. Now this seems like a pretty straightforward and a simple question, right? So let's turn it up a notch and look at a slightly more complex question. Okay. So our next question says, identify the final product that is formed in this given reaction sequence. So we have anilin here. We are treating anilin with concentrated HNO3 and H2SO4. We end up getting a mixture of products and we take one of those products and then carry out further reactions as you can see here. So I know this looks intimidating but trust me folks it's pretty straightforward and we'll find out why. So let's solve this question step by step. The first thing to do is to nitrate aniline. When aniline undergoes nitration we end up getting a mixture of products because the NH2 group here is highly activating group. NH2 group is a strong activating group. It directs the incoming electrophile to ortho and para position. It increases the electron density at these positions. And what is the electrophile here? NO2 plus, correct? So we obviously end up getting a mixture of ortho and para isomers. But in addition to that, we get a substantial amount of meta product. And that's because here we are subjecting aniline to an extremely acidic reaction condition. Concentrated HNO3 and concentrated H2SO4. And because of this, NH2 ends up getting protonated. So we get NH3 plus here. And this NH3 plus is a strong deactivating group. It will direct the incoming electrophile NO2 plus to the meta position. And that is why we end up getting a substantial amount of meta isomer as well. So let's look at the products that are formed here. P is a para isomer, para nitroaniline. Q is meta nitroaniline. And R is ortho nitroaniline. So you can see that the major product still is a para isomer but we have almost 47% of meta isomer formed. A substantial amount of meta isomer is formed here, correct? But we don't have to worry about these products now. We can focus on R which is the ortho isomer and carry out these reactions to find out the final product that is formed. Okay, so let's do that. So here we start with our ortho isomer, ortho nitroaniline and the first step is to acetylate it, correct? So we're reacting it or we're treating it with acetic anhydride in pyridine. And what does it do? It converts the NH2 group to the less reactive or less activating NHCOCH3. Yes, so you can see that by converting NH2 to NHCOCH3, we are decreasing the reactivity of the group, right? The lone pair of electrons now here is also delocalizing partially with the pi electrons of the C double bond group. And this is why this group becomes a much less activating group as compared to NH2. And what's the second reaction? Our next step is to brominate it. So we are treating this with bromine in the presence of acetic acid. Now, where do you think the electrophile will go to? Where do you think Br plus will go to? You see now there is a competing influence. You have NHCOCH3 which is still, yes it is weaker but it is still an orthopara directing group. It is still an activating group and you have NO2 which is a very strongly deactivating group. Correct? So if you have a competition between these two, it would be NO2 group that would dominate because NO2 is a really strong deactivating group. But if you compare NH2 and NO2, you can see that the effect of NH2, the activating effect of NH2 would be more dominant, which means it would direct any incoming electrophile to ortho and para position. But in this case, NO2 becomes more dominant and it would direct the incoming electrophile, which is Br plus to the position that is meta towards it. It's a meta directing group, right? So the position would be meta towards it. And interestingly, coincidentally, there's also the position para to NHCOCH3. So win-win, I would guess so. Anyway, the product formed here would be this. You can see that the incoming Br plus would attach itself to the para position. Now the next step is a hydrolysis step, which means we would get our NH2 back from NHCOCH3. After this, we are treating our aromatic amine with NaNO2 and HCl at low temperature, 273 Kelvin. Basically, we are carrying out a diazidization reaction. And what is the product obtained here? An aromatic diazonium salt, right? A benzene diazonium chloride. And we know that this is a very good intermediate. Benzene diazonium chloride is stable at low temperature, like 0 to 5 degrees. And we can perform many substitution reactions here. We can replace this group with other substituents and introduce them to the benzene ring. So the last step in the last reaction, we are heating it in ethanol. And what do you think happens here? Well, in this step, 
the N2 plus Cl minus. We are losing this group and it gets replaced by a simple hydrogen atom. Now, instead of this, instead of heating this benzene diazinium chloride with uh, ethanol, what if we treat it with Ki, potassium iodide? In that case, we would be replacing this group N2 plus Cl minus with an iodine group. So, here we can introduce an iodine. Or if we treated it with CuCl2, copper chloride and HCl, we would be introducing a chlorine here. So what I'm trying to say here is that this is a very useful intermediate, especially to introduce different groups into the benzene ring. So the product formed at the end of this reaction sequence is this.